Welcome to The Disruption Is Now. Join us on this enlightening journey as we explore how AI is impacting our jobs, careers, lives, and the human experience. Each episode, host Greg Matusky will converse with visionaries and innovators at the forefront of AI, diving into its challenges, opportunities, and impact. So buckle up as we venture into the heart of disruption, and together, let's unfold the future. Welcome to another podcast, another episode of The Disruption Is Now, the podcast where we talk about all things AI. And I got to tell you, I was thinking last night, I was very excited to have on our guest today because I think it's a unique example of the good that AI can do. And we'll talk about that in a moment. But it's also an example of how AI will create jobs. And everyone's concerned about the jobs that uh, it may destroy, but no one thinks about the opportunities that lie ahead. And, and our guest is the Vice President of Marketing for Climate AI. It's Meredith Mahea. And she's here today to talk a little bit about what they're doing to make the supply chain more re resilient because of climate change. And this is an urgent issue. I mean, this morning, as we're sitting here talking, you know, 5,000 people lost their lives in Libya because of two dams that gave way. And uh, every account says it's because of unusual, atypical flooding in the area due to climate change. So Meredith, did I get that right about climate AI? And can you add anything to it about what you're doing to make the world a better place? Yeah, thanks. First of all, Greg, thanks for having me. Um, yes, you you did get that right. We are using AI as well as you know data science, machine learning, all the tools at our disposal are at our disposal to really help companies understand um, the volatility of climate change because you know historical averages are no longer a great predictor of what's going to happen in the future. Um, so, you know, arming companies with this information helps them build resilience, whether it's um, understanding that, you know, they need to develop more drought resistant seeds for the future to ensure that our crops still can can grow and, and have the yields that are needed to support the population. Or if it's understanding that, um, you know, there's certain supply chain routes that may no longer be viable and, you know, and how we can work around that. Um, so it's really all about, you know, building that adaptation and resilience. And I find that really interesting. I think a lot of the discussion really focuses on, for instance, what I just talked about, the flooding in Libya, these major climate events. But really what we've seen with the pandemic is, is how fragile the supply chain is when it's a global supply chain. It comes from all over the world. And we don't know what, uh, what disruption does because we've, we've become so used to uh, going on Amazon and having it delivered by next day. So tell me a little bit about the kind of uh, work that you look at and the kind of disruptions that could affect uh, future commerce and society. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, if you just if you look at, for example, hurricanes, um, they're very difficult to predict. Uh, we, we do, you know, we do predict them. Um, but they're, you know, these are very volatile events and they can wipe out, you know, an entire fleet, uh, of, of vehicles or, you know, make, um, waterways impassable, et cetera. So just understanding, um, what, you know, what may come there and how to diversify those routes, um, is, is really helpful. Um, you know, just to your point about ordering on, from Amazon, people, a lot of times blame the pandemic or politics for the prices they're seeing at the grocery store. But much of, of those price increases is due to climate change, is due to the fact that, you know, um, a, a huge swath of the olive crops were, were wiped out in Europe, um, that, you know, there were no Georgia peaches this summer. Um, and this this is all climate related. And just just being able to understand, you know, are there different ways, are there different areas we can grow in? Are there different ways that, that we can kind of mitigate these circumstances? Um, helps not just the kind of actual movement of the supply chain, but the supply itself, um, which, and you know- which Let's linger on that for a moment, because when we spoke earlier, you talked about not all of it is bad. Right. Making the supply chain more resilient it isn't a doomsday scenario. It's rather finding alternatives, understanding opportunities, change, which is very hard in established supply chains sometimes. So tell us a little bit about the findings that you've had that could make a better world for us all. Yeah. So, um, you know, France is is the epicenter of like fine wine, champagne, of course. Thank God. Um, and well, it unfortunately France is becoming so hot that the grapes are becoming too sweet. 
um, for many of the classic wines and champagnes that we're used to because the grapes are essentially getting cooked um, on the vine. So, you know, fast forward now, um, we see in England, there are some areas that are, because they've become a bit warmer, are growing grapes that would traditionally be used for champagne and growing them well. Um, so it's not all, like you said, it's not all doom and gloom. There are opportunities that can be found. And that's really one thing that Climate AI focuses on for our customers is finding, you know, where's that next location where, where these things can be more, you know, where these crops can be more viable or where it's easier to, to move product back and forth. And uh, yeah, and in, again, ensure that resiliency into the future by finding those opportunities, not just solely focusing on mitigating the risks. And this this ability to model, I mean, these kinds of things, you're talking about the, the grape harvest in France. I mean, some of these, I understand vineyards are hundreds of years old, but these things can't be turned on a dime. And the ability to use, if I'm getting, if I'm understanding you correctly, AI machine learning to model them out you really do avoid a lot of the pitfalls which would come from the typical trial and error of anything from new seed propagation to new new uh, new uh, crops that could be grown. So that modeling really plays a big role in this, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and for, you know, whether it's wine grapes, which I, I believe take decades to really mature to, you know, the vine for the, the vines and the plants to mature to where they need to be. Um, you know, it takes about 10 years to develop a new seed variety. So these are very long term things that companies need to understand what is, you know, what are the conditions going to be like at that point? And if they're not going to be hospitable to, for what I need, where else can I look? And that's another tool that we have, which is called Climate Analogs, um, which allows companies to basically say, where is going to look like this ideal growing location I have today, 20, 30 years from now? So I can start investing and I can start, you know, kind of preparing for that scenario. And these have to do with, these are long-term decision-making. They have to do with here in the U.S. I mean, our preparedness, our competitiveness, our readiness is, is at stake. We're such a big producer of agricultural crops. And having the visibility into that is, is, is a great gift. And being able to make decisions now, again, that could portend the future with AI and machine learning. So tell me a little bit about the data that goes into this. Like, where does it come from? Where does it originate? And, and then um, how, is it, how is it accessed? Do you use LLMs? Do you use natural language processing? If I'm a user, right, what is the data? How do I interface with it? Because that's yeah. always a big question in the world of AI. Yeah, um, so, and I think you really hit on what makes AI, uh, you know, what makes it so powerful is that it puts information that normally only scientists would be able to access and understand in the hands of an average person um, in a, a user friendly software interface. Um, so that's really, you know, what our platform does. We, we ingest hundreds of data sources, um, a lot of them public um, that, you know, anybody could access. But as I said before, historical data is no longer a great predictor of, of future events. So what we layer on top of it is our algorithms that take that volatility into account and that also kind of grade the different data sources on their, their past accuracy for a particular situation. Um, so we're really pulling the best, most accurate data sources. And then we are also layering on business information. So what have yields been in the past when conditions have been like this? And what will yields look like if, let's say, you know, the temperature goes up X amount? Um, and that really makes the information actionable as well, because it's one thing to say, well, yeah, over the next 10 years, uh, it's going to get X percent hotter. But what does that mean? What does that mean? What should you do about that? Um, and that's really where our platform comes in and really helps companies understand how they need to act today to react to what's going to happen in the future. So let me get this straight then. It does have a natural language interface to it, like, like OpenAI or chat. Um, is that uh, it doesn't you're... have like a, you know, a chat GPT kind of search um, component, but it's really about, you know, you basically come in, you set up your locations, um, you set up risk, you know, what what's important to you? Because not every company or not every product is going to be affected by every type of risk. So you you choose like, hey, I really care about drought. Um, I care about wildfire risk, for example. And you kind of set weights to those things based on your own business and your own location. Um, and then it just 
you know, it processes that data and it gives it, it slices and dices it in a bunch of different ways. Um, and again, gives you insight into what will happen in different emission scenarios and different, um, you know, different temperature ranges, et cetera. There's all different ways you can kind of play with it and, and spit out these reports that you can then socialize with your team and eventually make their way to the people on the ground who are actually doing the planting and the harvesting and the, you know, the moving of, of things to the supply well, chain. That, that, I always try to explain to, to people, right? Like where we are, where we've been and where we are, right? In my world, I use, uh, AI in a generative sense in communications and language. And that's what it's built around. And that specifically was built for language because it wants to please us and talk to us like we have. And, and in my world, the data was always words, right? Like most people struggle when they want to write something with the words, they know where they want to get, but they just, you know, I got writer's block or I just can't say it, or we have all kinds of terms to explain that. And that was the information. And we were swimming in data and information as of five years ago. But this world of being able then to gain intelligence was beyond most of us. Uh, I, I'm the last thing in the world from a da data analyst. I could never make sense of it. What's so exciting to me now is the ability to say, I'm not going to focus on the data. The data, the machine's going to do the data. I'm going to focus on the insights. I'm going to train myself to understand where do I want to go in this emerging world? And how can this machine help me see the scenarios that's going to lay out that path? And it sounds like to me, and you can correct me, that's really what climate AI is doing for the good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, I think it's, it's just putting all these overwhelming amounts of data into a digestible format that somebody sitting there saying, uh, you know, hey, I have these strawberries that are sitting there. If I if they get too hot, they're going to lose all their flavor. They're going to turn to mush. How do I, you know, when and how do I act on this? And it's, you know, it's, it's right in front of their face. They don't have to pour through rows and rows of Excel sheets or, or ask a, you know, a meteorologist. Um, they can just log into the Climate Lens platform and, you know, and get their insights there. Now, let, let's go back for a second, because I think I brought up two points when I started, right? The good that can come from AI, which is often muted when everyone starts talking about the risks and, and, and will this be a generalized intelligence that is greater than ours and could doom mankind and people start uh, future telling. But what about the goodness that it creates opportunities and jobs? And you're a living example of that because you didn't come from climate tech. And you specifically made a decision to change your life and career path. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I before I came to Climate AI, I was working in B two B enablement for e commerce, so working with you know some of the largest retailers in the world, um, which was a great business during COVID. No, a noble COVID. undertaking. Noble undertaking. <laughs> no, I, I just mean you know during COVID, e commerce exploded. It was it was really a great time to be in that in that industry. Um, but, you know, I was starting to do some climate activism in my um, in my personal life. You know, I have two young children, six and three, and I'm, you know, very worried about the world that they're going to inherit. And it just wasn't sitting right with me, um, you know, enabling these fashion retailers, many of them fast fashion retailers who, uh, you know, fast fashion wreaks havoc on the environment with water usage and pollution and uh, emissions. And I just started to feel a real uh, conflict there. So I just decided, you know, I was it was kind of looking for a change anyway. I'd been there for a few years and I just decided, you know, I think the next job I, I have needs to be aligned with my values. Um, so I started looking into climate tech because, as you said, it's a very um, fast growing field. The challenge for a senior marketer is there are not many senior marketing positions in climate tech because they're mostly startups and most startups don't. Um, start marketing very early on, or they don't have a, you know, at least a senior leader in that, in that position. But I'm very lucky that our CEO, Hamanchu Gupta, he, uh, you know, really understands the value of marketing and under, and understands marketing itself. He has a great, uh, creative marketing mind. And he's, at, you know, they were in series A going towards series B and said, okay, it's time for a senior marketer. Um, and I'm lucky that, you know, the recruiter found me and it was, it was a really great fit. It's, it's truly a, a wonderful company to work for. And for anyone out there that's listening, you made an ethical decision that took courage. Can you give them any advice about them and their career and how AI might op open opportunities that they don't see and how there could be real uh, 
a real source of good out there in a broader sense and what AI brings to the table. Yeah, I mean, um, I think, th yeah, of course, there's there's jobs where you might feel a little less positive about about using AI um, for different things, especially if you're dealing with like people's personal data, you know, sometimes um, the kind of creepy side of like advertising can feel a little icky. But if you're if you really are passionate about something like climate or ev I've even seen um, AI being used, for example, in creating better diversity in, in workplaces as far as, you know, companies hiring and whatnot. So there's a lot of really positive applications for AI. You just have, kind of have to, you know, get a feel for it, do your research. And, um, you know, I, I, if you're interested in climate tech, I highly recommend, you know, um, the job boards. Like there's this board Climate Base, which I look at. I still look at every day because they, they put out great climate news and you can just kind of get a sense of how the landscape is developing. Um, and the good thing is you don't really because the field is so new, um, both climate tech and AI, you rarely need experience specific to those those areas um, because very few people have that experience. So it's really about, you know, taking the skills that you've used in whatever industry you're in right now and then taking them into those um, those fields where people are just, you know, trying to recruit because, yeah, you're not going to find an experienced climate tech AI marketer because uh, it's only been around for you know for a handful of years. So I would say just don't um, don't worry about it. Don't worry that you don't have that exact experience. Just take your skills and uh, yeah, do some networking and some research. And there's a lot of great uh, opportunities out there. Well, I, I should have said at the beginning, in full transparency, climate AI is is a client of Gregory FCA. But I'm very honored to be representing what you're doing. I'm very excited to learn about your career path and what it means for broader opportunities for individuals. Um, I know in my own life, Meredith, I'll share with you that AI has really reinvigorated my career because for years I had struggled. I was a writer and I opened a PR firm some 30 years ago, but I struggled to teach others how to write. And when I first saw open AI chat GPT in November of 2022, I literally giggled. I said, it took me 30 years to do this. And now I can really help people because before it was all seminars and words and, and people in, <laughs> they liked my presentations, but I really couldn't affect them and help them get to the next le level of really communicating messages. Cause I always believed that communication is really about spurring understanding, right? What you've done today is help us understand this world of supply chain uh, resilience. And so for me, right, I believe anything which helps us better understand each other can be a force for good. And I think climate AI is a perfect example of that. So I'd like to thank you for being with us. And it was very enlightening. And congratulations on your, your career boost and also the success of climate AI. Thank you so much. It was great to be here. This podcast is a production of Gregory FCA. If you enjoyed our discussion today and want to continue exploring the transformative power of AI, please check out more episodes and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.